Um, now I want to open up uh, to a set of questions and comments, and then I'm also going to give a bit of an opportunity for some of the uh, speakers to have a, a right of response, I think, also to, to Michaela's challenges um, as well, because I don't want to leave those completely hanging in the air. So I'm going to sort of sweep around the room. So if you've got your question, please give me your, your name and uh, use a microphone. So the lady at the back first, please. Uh, thank you. My name's Elizabeth Blunt. I'd like to offer you something that was said to me in Togo, where I was observing the election in 2010. We were sent to a big opposition area in the southeast. At the previous election, there'd been huge riots after the results, and we were told that the results which were um, collected, counted, signed off, and sent to the capital were not the ones that were finally announced from Lomé. And we went to see the person in charge of the region in 2010, who was a government appointee, who was never ever going to say the government cheated last time. But he said to us, you know, a child does not cry for nothing. And in 2010, the results that were sent were the ones that were announced. People were not happy. It wasn't the result they wanted, but they didn't riot. And I would have thought that people, including people in Kenya, can accept disappointment as long as they don't think it's been stolen. And I don't think the people in Ghana thought it was stolen. Kenya, obviously, we're still waiting. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I at the front here and then over to Irina on the other side? And keep it to a question, please. This is going to be comments. Yeah. Um, the the elections in Sri Lanka, they are still discovering our uh, elect election boxes uh, uh, from laybys, uh, remote laybys, after three or four years after the election, uh, and the violence, uh, murders uninvestigated. The president prevents murder. So now the donors are parliamentarians invited here? Right. Uh, idea. Ten years ago, there was uh, uh, some research on Sri Lanka party elections and parties and all that. Uh, but uh, now the same thing is happening. So how are these uh, research uh, findings uh, used by politicians or donors? Um, they supported these, all these donors support. Now they are going to so go say uh, they are going to attend the Chogum there in Sri Lanka, where every day uh, murders are happening and uh, these, all these uh, atro atrocities are happening. So what, where are we learning lessons? Mm. Okay. And Good how question. are we coordinate, coordinating research findings and research institutes? Okay, thank you. Behind, um, the lady behind, thank you. And then we'll go over to Alina. <coughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. <coughs> My name's Josie Opong. My question is for Kojo about um, the most recent Ghana elections. You mentioned briefly about the passing of... Can you speak up just a little bit? Rob, can we have a bit You more? mentioned about the Thank passing you. of President Atta Mills. Um, just wanted to ask if you could um, speak a bit more about that. Um, and just wondering, to what extent do you think that the peaceful elections in Ghana were somehow related to that? I mean, it was just a few months since the president died and there was such a massive outpouring of kind of grief and unity and um, want for peace and so on. So to what extent do you think that <coughs> the electoral result, um, the success of Mahama was influenced by the death of the president? Okay, great. And then over to Alina there, please. <coughs> Thank you, Alina Rochamenokal from ODI. Thank you all very much for uh, very wonderful and informative um, discussions about the electoral processes in both Kenya and Ghana. And I have a couple of questions, if, if I may, uh, that are hopefully tied to one another. But one of the things that comes across very clearly from, uh, from what you have all been saying is that there's not a linear process through which elections uh, can provide answers to the puzzle of democratization processes. And one of the key things perhaps <coughs> distinguishing Ghana and Kenya is this a sense of mitigating, in a way, the winner-takes-all dynamics that are generated in the, in the Kenyan uh, process much more than in the Ghanaian one. I wonder if this is true and why Ghana has been able to manage that a bit better. And also, if there's this winner-takes-all dynamic, 
And there's such a focus on elections all the time in relatively short uh, periods of time. What does that mean in terms of providing the space that is needed to be able to actually get on with the process of reforming these countries and having an agenda for change? Okay, thank you very much, Lena. Now I'm gonna go back to the panel, and yes, very quickly, and then I'm gonna go back to the panel. Um, the microphone's behind you. Um, Sabine Guinea from Coffee International Development. Um, I wanted to, I guess, generate more discussion. I think it will apply both to Gabriela and Kojo. Um, Kojo, during your presentation, you mentioned briefly the role of the international community. And I think it's quite interesting because don't we, to some extent, think that the perception of the international community on the election happening in a country generates a context either of peace or fear. Looking at Ghana, everything we heard before the election was beacon of hope, looking forward to Ghana, they're going to continue the transition. And then when we, look, we go into the Kenyan context, all we hear is hopefully there won't be any more violence. How can we limit? How are we gonna uh, deal with the violence afterwards? Mm. So in my mind, if I'm sitting in either of those countries and th those expectations are set for myself, how do I naturally react to those? Um, that would be my first question. The second question had to do with, um, I'm sorry, Michaela's comment of buy-in. And to some extent, all I've heard um, today had to do with the process. You mentioned that elections are no longer an event, but more of a process. But I think to some extent, we're still focusing on the process. How do we train institution? How do we make sure the media is sending <laughs> out the right message? How do we make sure the machines are working? But I'm asking beyond that, what happens with the everyday people? What do we teach our children in school, civic education? What is made so that it's not so much about how the machines of election work, but how do we promote a democratic culture? So regardless of the election that is coming, our fear is not about will there be violence after, but how will people themselves will willingly continue that uh, transition? Fantastic, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, I'm actually now going to go to uh, Dowdy. Would you like to react a little bit? There's obviously quite a lot on the table. There's quite a strong reaction um, from Michaela, particularly around the sort of technological fixes uh, that were introduced, and that in fact, to the extent that they actually didn't deliver. But also, I think that latter point about moving beyond the, the kind of uh, uh, technical baggage of elections to actually how do you instill a democratic culture which will actually build buy into elections? Would you like to take a stab at some of those? Sure. Um, yeah, there's no doubt that there was a massive failure in the technology around this election. Um, yeah, you know, with, with hindsight, you know, we there are a couple of things I have to mention. First of all, many of us felt that it was important that we get to election day with the credibility of the IEBC as high as possible. And perhaps we should have raised some of these concerns more publicly, but we were I guess maybe a bit afraid of damaging the reputation of the IBC to the point where it it wouldn't have been able to conduct an election that was credible. With hindsight, perhaps we should have changed that. Um, but there's there, no doubt that there was a big failure in the technology. Um, we've raised concerns about this before. We raised concerns during the process against the wishes of, of many people. And this is going to be one of the areas that I'm going to, that I suspect will We'll see never-ending stories about this. Um, our newspapers yesterday were full of stories from the director of technology at the Electoral Commission saying that you no know, equipment was procured against his recommendations. So this looks like something that will go on and on. On the, on the question of the peace narrative, um, I think that process was largely owned and started by Kenyans. And perhaps we forget how close to the edge Kenya got in 2008. It really was, you know, a matter of days where we felt that Kenya would just go over a cliff and would have a full civil war. So this time, the, you know, the, the peace message was very important. It was very important to pull back from the edge. You know, people in areas like Molo telling you that for the first time they had an election without significant violence is, you know, something to celebrate. However, the suspension of critical thinking, the suspension of you know, positive criticism that accompanied that movement, you know, is something that we cannot be proud of at all. There was an, you know, an incident when in the middle of all the vote counting fiasco, the chairman of the Ike Commission asked the media who were the tallying center if they had any questions, and there wasn't a single question raised, and, you know, 
my reaction was, you know, we should have gotten a few more bloggers accredited to sit at the tallying center, because I'm sure bloggers would have had a couple of questions to ask. But yes, yeah, so the peace narrative was owned by Kenyans. I think the reason why many of us pushed it, you know, so widely was because we realized how close to the edge we got last time. But, you know, I don't think we'll have this again next time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Kojo, let me turn to you. I mean, this point that actually Michaela was making about um, the sort of tech role of technology we actually went beyond simply whether or not it was there or not, but actually it doesn't replace something yeah. which is really fundamental in elections, which is actually this notion of sort of buy-in to a democratic mm -hmm. process. And I just wondered how you see that in, a, in the Ghanaian, because you mentioned the role of biometric um, voting and so on. But also I wonder if you, you know, there is um, a point about the role of international support and you gave a very positive picture in, in mm. Ghana of how, of how that international support has helped deliver a, 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 a relatively peaceful and effective process. But I think everybody's got to raise the question is really? I mean, are you really that uh, uh, positive about the role of external agencies in this? Okay. Well, thank you for the first question, because actually I wanted to respond to Michaela mm. about, about technology. I mean, for me, it is... Yeah, just sorry. Sorry. For me, it, it, it has been very positive in, in Ghana, um, in spite of the, of the problems. In 2008, one of the big problems we had was that the parties in a very competitive elections were trying to max out in their strongholds and basically turn their strongholds into properties and created sort of a no-go area for, for their opponents. Because you know, if you can max out, then you hope that in the competitive areas, you know, it, it would eventually the numbers will fall for you. So introducing the biometric voter registration and the biometric verification process was an important thing because what it did prevent was overvoting and then ballot stuffing. Because one of the, 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 the fraud that uh, parties will perpetrate is that if you have 100 people on the, on the voter uh, register mm. uh, and it's a stronghold and everybody's for one party and the poll worker uh, basically has been intimidated, if 60 people came to vote, they would just add the 40. And, and once it's in the ballot box, you can count it. So once you have a verification process where it can, you can tally the number of people who have actually verified on the day with the number of, of, of ballots in the box, you cut, cut that out and you solve a problem. I mean, you, you can't stop minors registering, for instance, with biometric voter registration or foreigners coming to register. Those are, you have to, imp so for me, it has been positive, and I think the Electoral Commission would, would improve, improve on that. But the point is also why people want to foul the election, isn't it? I mean, the fact is that this is one way of avoiding it. Yeah. Why is that a continuing it's, objective? It's, it's part of the structural factors uh, that uh, I think uh, uh, we were talking about earlier, in the sense that it's still a winner-takes-all process. It's still about state capture and controlling mm. resources. Mm. And, and people want to win so that they can have control over the process and do the distribution. And they don't trust the other person to do that. Dr. Westcott, uh, uh, Nicholas Westcott, who was a former British High Commissioner to Ghana, I mean, made this, this point uh, you know, brilliant about if you, don't, if you don't have trust in the system, it doesn't matter what technology you, you put in place. Mm -hmm. You know, people can just abandon the, the process and say we don't have any trust in it and you know we'll disrupt it. So that part is important and that's why I refer to some of the processes we build in Ghana over the years, some of the informal institutions we've set up. Those I think has, has been the underpinning uh, 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 structures that makes uh, uh, the rollout of a technology work. You know, so Just one more point. Yeah, the, the other uh, about Atamilz's uh, death I can tell you that um, probably after the mourning period, which was very, very short, it was straight to politicking. Um, <laughs> you know, for a period we were brought together, you know, this was the first time this happened. But immediately after that, people went back, you know, to sort of <coughs> insulting each other and, and, and you know, campaigning and, and, and all of that. But I think for civil society, this, we had built that process long that, you know, we had to make sure that this election was going to be peaceful. So it wasn't when Atamil's died. Maybe it, had, it may have added something for civil society. For the parties, they were just back to you know, uh, uh, you know, the, their, their own 
processes. And just the issue about inculcating uh, sort of a democratic culture. And I think that's the other thing uh, in Ghana, that there are organizations that in between elections continue the process of education. And I've, I mentioned the Afrobarometer um, you know, uh, surveys, which tells you, when you ask people what they understand by democracy, most people will say freedom or free speech. Uh, and that seems one of the things that you know people like the fact that they have an open space, they have a, sp a civic space, having understanding what accountability means. Because one of the things that Afrobarometer does show <coughs> is that we are very passive <coughs> as, as as citizens. We wouldn't go on a demonstration or or hold our MP accountable, or you know we we, we don't we don't do those things. So there there are gaps there that that we have to <coughs> feel in order for us to be able mm. to sort of match that with the with election infrastructure. Great, thank you. Gabriel. Um, first of all, the, the uh, point about Togo. I mean, I agree with you that people are unlikely to protest and demonstration over, demonstrate over election results if they think those results are the right ones. But I don't think it necessarily follows that the absence of protest and demonstration means that people accept the results. Uh, I know lots of people in Kenya who don't accept the results, and I think there are other reasons why you don't go and demonstrate and, and protest. One of them is the strength of this peace narrative that really has closed the space and has really fueled the idea that a successful election was a peaceful election, um, and that in itself is a step forward and will be part of a gradual uh, movement forward. But also the security presence in strategic places. I mean, where people were likely to riot, the police and the GSU were out in force uh, and very quickly not just stopped any violence that happened but broke apart groups that were gathering even before they were violent. Um, so I really do think that can be another explanation. Um, another issue is um, when saying this kind of international um, kind of image of the situation and whether it's one of, of fear or hope and how people react to that. I mean, I think in the Kenyan context, and this idea that you know, going into this election, there was real fear that things could go wrong and there could be violence. How did people react to that? In lots of ways, but I think in two particularly prominent ones. One was to constantly re-emphasize the importance of peace because of how, you know, as Dowdy said, what happened in 2007, 2008, how close to the brink people felt that Kenya got. Um, and this meant that when there were questions, for example, about the IEBC, you know, lots of civil society organizations, uh, lots of media, also donors, didn't publicly raise these, these issues because they didn't want to damage the integrity of the process, because they didn't want a repeat of the problems. Another reaction was to exit. Um, so this time around, there was a real feeling that if anyone was going to be targeted, it would be the Lua. So Luo, in lots of cosmopolitan areas, left those areas. They went and they registered back in Luo Nyanza, and they travelled back to Luo Nyanza for the election. Um, so that's another way in which people reacted, and obviously it decreased the likelihood of violence, but, I mean, not necessarily in a particularly positive way if, if, if for the long term. Um, in terms of the technological aspect and this comparison between Ghana and Kenya, I think one of the interesting things is that in Ghana, when you had the introduction of poll books, you just used the poll books. So if the poll book didn't work, you couldn't vote, which obviously raised problems. But it also meant that people really put in the effort to make sure the poll books worked as widely as possible. Whereas in Kenya, you had the poll books, these electronic voter identification devices, but you also had a paper register. Yeah? And as soon as the electronic voter identification device didn't work, for any reason, people understandably went straight to the paper register. So I was at polling streams uh, on election day where people had the laptop uh, for the electronic voter identification, they had the two spare batteries, and they'd been told that the spare batteries would last for about five hours each. Mm -hmm. So they put the table, although, although they were in a room with electricity, the electricity was working, they'd set up the <coughs> table too far away from the power <coughs> socket because they didn't think they needed to plug it in because they thought the battery would last for long enough. Understa you know, the batteries didn't last for very long because they hadn't been tested properly. They went through all three batteries very quickly and then moved on to the paper register. So there was very little effort in many places to make sure that that 
that to make sure the technology worked because you still had the paper register, which then allowed spaces for manipulation if people wanted to take advantage of that. And this is the problem about it not working because people don't really know what happened. Uh, and here I, I agree with Michaela in terms of the integrity of the IEBC. I mean, I think, I mean, I was raising issues to do with the IEBC going into the election, as many people were, but for, you know, because of concerns about destabilizing the situation and leading to fears, not very publicly. Um, and I think you now have a context where people will never really know the, f the result. Um, you know, 50.07 percent, only 8,000 votes over the 50 percent plus one. This is a very small margin of error, especially when the safeguards that were introduced didn't work. Um, so I think the integrity of the IEBC is in question. Um, however, I think for various <laughs> reasons, uh, it does seem as if Uhura and Ruto and the Jubilee Alliance won significantly more votes than called. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons, another reason why people are more willing um, to accept even, you know, even the problems that they've seen. Um, there are other issues, but I'll... Great. Can you just boil that down for me? Great. Thank you very much. I mean, I think I need to come to you now, Syed, because you, are, you in a sense, put up, stuck out your neck and actually <laughs> argued quite strongly that you felt the IEBC has come out pretty well from this election. We've got two very contrasting views here, and I think a certain amount of skepticism in the room. So take that. Yeah, my, can, would you like to just relate? And, and what is the basis for your assessment? Yeah. OK, now, I'm, I'm not here to, to be an advocate of the, of the IBC. I think, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, Mikhail acknowledged that I said uh, it's still not finished. And uh, let's, let's wait to hear the court. But let me say why I grounded my, 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 my views. <coughs> um, there were several public opinion surveys last year which pointed, and this is the fact, that IBC was the most trusted institution of in, in Kenya. Now, as I said, IBC was bruised along the way from boundary delimitation, announcement of election uh, day, uh, procurement, and, and, and so on. I would be very interesting to see now how they rate in terms of, of uh, public opinion or, 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 or the trust that they enjoy among Kenyans. I would uh, assume that, uh, that they might have a take, a, take a strong hit, but uh, let, let's wait to see. Now, in t and this is, this is reputation-wise. Integrity, I'm really looking back into 2007. And uh, when, when, when the chairman of the election commission stood up and said at the end, he said, I don't know what my people mm -hmm. are doing in the field. They must be cooking results. And this is where, where Kenya exploded. And the Kriegler, Krieg, Judge Kriegler's report, in which Judge Kriegler was, was the very reputable individual who was uh, invited <coughs> to assess how electoral processes contributed to the, to the violence in 2007-08. He wrote, there is a specific sentence, which he said, I, I was amazed to, to how well Kenyans remember words of the chairman six months after the election. So that was something, it still really echoes. When you ask people why, they will just quote uh, uh, chairman of the election commission. Now, I have heard so many uh, rumors from the experts, from international community, and from Kenyans who are well informed. They said, if IBC runs into a problem, they will break apart. You will see them aligning with, with the different candidates. And everyone was, was watching their performance in BOMAS. Yes, they need to, to, to respond to some issues. Why did they ask uh, political party observers and journalists to leave, uh, tallying and so on? But the fact is, when, 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 when chairman announced results, commission appeared to me again uh, that they, they stood united. Maybe they didn't felt united, but this is how they protected themselves for the Kenyans. Again, I think going back to, to, to Gab what Gabriella was saying, everyone knows what's, a, what's on the stake now. And, and now how, they, uh, how openly do we want to go out with some concerns and does it really need to be that open? I think there is, there is a court 
which can really look into all these specific matters and the things that we are raising here are now at the core. So from my perspective, I like to interpret what I see and understand that there is a process behind which will hopefully help, help clarify these things. Okay, Thanks. okay Lauren, um, I mean, even beyond the IBC, a couple of, um, I think particularly Dowdy and, and Kojo referred to um, there being kind of palpable improvement in the sort of st the strength of institutions engaged in the electoral processes, particularly in Ghana, but also to some extent in this election in Kenya. I mean, y you seem doubtful on this. I mean, where's your alternative view coming from? What are, what are the, the, the parameters you're using to suggest that actually, you know, no change here? We should be equally worried as we were in 2000. Uh, well, I'm not saying no change. I'm s it is a different re uh, election. Mm. Um, but um, I, I, I don't think I think it's been a far from satisfactory experience. Um, a huge emphasis is being put on the court, and uh, you know we we have this uh, chief justice that everyone puts enormous trust in, William Mutunga. Um, you know, these are not institutions whose credibility goes back decades and decades and decades and centuries. Uh, the, the 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 judiciary has has just been going through this this. Uh, uh, this new process in which judges are being appointed, vetted very publicly. You can see them being questioned, their CVs poured over in public. That's wonderful, but that's only uh, a process that's been taking on for, uh, for the last couple of years. And already there are detailed analysis taking place of uh, which way the Supreme Court is likely to divide in terms of ethnic affiliations. Uh, and in terms of uh, sympathies and therefore, you know, predictions on which way they're likely to vote. So it, it's quite clear that an analysts who are looking at Kenya um, see this as an institution that is, is young and has, this is going to be its biggest and a massive test. I mean, imagine having to decide who was elected president in, uh, of the country. I mean, no, no court judge wants to, to face that that decision. Uh, so, you know, you're putting a huge amount of pressure to bear on a very, very young um, I institution that's never been through this test before. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. I've got time for a few more reflections. Can we get a mic over here on to the far side, please? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. My name is Wouter Dole. I work at the Netherlands Institute for Multi-Party Democracy, and we both have programs in Ghana and in Kenya. Um, on relation to the Kenya, the recent Kenya elections, I wonder if you have any views, especially on the increased uh, role of money in the uh, campaign. Uh, there was a reluctance to have a campaign financing bill. Uhuru obviously has extremely deep pockets, uh, ferrying with helicopters around the country. It was a big advantage. Courts coffers are now empty, so everybody sort of also takes uh, into account that any uh, runoff would definitely also be his win, whether it is legal or illegal. So I wonder if you have any um, um, views on this. Thank you very much. The role of money. Uh, Richard, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Richard Crook. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Richard Crook from Institute of Development Studies, Sussex. Um, just a quick question, but on a, a, a much broader issue, really. While I take the point about the, the, um, uh, the role of the Electoral Commission in Ghana and, and the other technical aspects which have been done very well, I think Kojo put his finger on a key point when he said um, what's different in Ghana is that um, ethnicity has not been a winning factor in elections. And I think this goes to the core of the difference between Ghana and Kenya. We know that ethnic politics is the product of mobilization by politicians and, and ethnic entrepreneurs. And uh, Crawford Young said that in his, the best ever book written about cultural pluralism in Africa in 1976. We know that Virtually every country in Africa, I think perhaps apart from Botswana and Lesotho, is a multicultural country. So you have to ask yourself, why is it that in some countries ethnic politics becomes mobilized and destructive and in others it doesn't? Um, Crawford Young suggests that it's because there's a payoff. The structure of politics is such that there'll be a payoff to ethnic mobilization. And in Ghana, winning coalitions have been created for elections which don't depend on ethnic mobilization as such. Whereas in Kenya, until very recently, and I think maybe even now, ethnic mobilization has produced a payoff. 
to the people who indulge in it. Mm. And so I'd really just like to ask whether the experts in Kenya can see any way forward of, of mitigating or demobilizing ethnic politics. The Nigerians tried a little bit with, with various devices for spreading the vote and making it impossible for an ethnic vote to, 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 to count. <laughs> and I wonder whether this has been thought about in Kenya. Great, thank you. Um, gentleman at the front here, is that right? Yes. And then um, the woman over on the, my far right. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name's Mark Boland, I'm an economist, so it's going to be also about money and in line with what my, uh, what the Dutch uh, <coughs> gentleman over there said. And Some people have linked the very expansive fiscal policy in Ghana with the very competitive politics, and I was quite intrigued by the map you showed with that uh, this competition goes down to very, um, to the constituency level and to what degree would you say that this fiscal, uh, quite expansive fiscal policy with the uh, new, the spine, um, uh, the uh, spine agreement with yeah, the uh, public wage cool. levels yeah. is connected to this very competitive political environment and how do you see it going forward? I mean, this is one of, this expansive fiscal policy was one of the reasons why why mm -hmm. the uh, Ghanaian city was depreciated a lot sure. and that Ghana was downgraded by Standard Poor's very recently. Okay, thank you. And then, woman in that corner, please. Thank you. My name's Olivia Toy from the Gatsby Foundation. Um, we work in agricultural sectors <coughs> in East Africa. Um, so my question relates to um, Gabrielle's presentation at the start when she talked about the different factors which meant um, so far there hasn't been violence in the elections. Um, and I know your, your colleague, Daniel Branch, at, at Warwick University, takes the very s cynical but perhaps pragmatic view that the reason there wasn't violence was because of the, the alliance between the Kalenjin and the Kikuyu. It, it meant it wasn't strategically advantageous to have any violence, so there it wasn't funded and um, it wasn't necessary. So I'd like to ask the panel whether they agree with that view and also the w what they think the, the strength of the Jubilee Alliance is if Kenyatta does become president, whether that alliance of the Kikuyu and and Kalenjin will continue. Great, thank you. And on that, I'm going to basically give everyone a sort of last reflection, really, and pick up one of those, because we've got a number of meaty questions there. They always come at the end, don't they? Yeah. Um, so do pick, pick, pick one you want to respond to. But I just want to connect this to a, to a question we've actually had online from Deborah, who's sitting uh, in Nairobi. She works as a research analyst in, in Nairobi. Um, more or less picking up on this point that, Richard, you made about, you know, what is it about the... the um, the, the payoff to, to ethnic, but ethnically based ba voting in Kenya, but she, she expresses a real concern that while it may have not ended in, in, a, in a conflictual election day itself, you know, engage with social media right now in Kenya and something very different is going on. And, and <coughs> how, do, how, does, how do we sort of maintain a certain amount of control over that? So I'm going to go in reverse order this time. Michaela, do you want to pick up something that um, you want to react to? Uh, yes, I th I'm glad that, uh, that you raised the point of the Jubilee Alliance because we, we should have talked about that more. That was a key factor in keeping violence down because the two, well, two of the ethnic communities that were at each other's throats last time were you know, both represented and, and in, in the Jubilee Alliance. I went to Eldoret and Nakuru, talked to people there, and they, there was deep cynicism about how long that alliance will last, and, and very specific warnings that when it fell apart there would be new violence, because none of the issues that, have, uh, that were you know, uh, bubbled up during 2007, which are long-standing gripes and, and grudges about land, uh, have ever been satisfactorily addressed. So they were saying all this stuff will come out later when the journalists have all gone home and the alliance falls apart, then there'll be then there'll be trouble. Mm. Um, I hope that's not the case, but that's what certainly people on, on uh, uh, civil society activists were telling me uh, up there. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't remember what what the other question was, but you, the, the basically the, this issue of of getting um, um, uh, uh, <coughs> a, a payback from the system, therefore, so the winners takes all system. I mean, in Kenya, the, that, that's the whole idea behind the devolved new constitution of 2010. Uh, and, and the point is, I think that will have a massive impact. It really will. 
Um, and it's very interesting to see what's going to happen on that and who's come out as winners in all these senatorial and governor contests. But of course, uh, to the people who are waiting for the results of the Supreme Court finding, they're not yet vi seeing any visible material benefit from the new constitution yet because it's too early on. So for them, they see this contest as like, you know, win or die. You know, if we if we don't if our guy doesn't win these elections, we're out in the cold for the next five years. That may not be the case because the new constitution will mean that they have a lot more devolved funding, devolved power, but they can't see that yet because it hasn't happened yet. Right. Thank you. Only one um, respond to one question, please. Maybe the money one. We've run out of time, basically. Oh, Sorry. really? <laughs> That's not the one. I, wa I wanted to answer all of the others. I yeah, have lots I of know. very interesting we things to say, <laughs> um, but I've been banned. Um, oh well. Um, in terms of finance, uh, yeah, massively important. Um, this just huge amounts of money spent in the, in this election, uh, and it did highlight one of the failings of new rules and regulations and institutions that have been put in place. Um, there, <laughs> there are new pieces of legislation which should have had a closer monitoring of the amounts of money and the kind of money that was spent and there's clear evidence of things like voter bribery going on um, and no repercussions for people when they were involved or engaged in those kind of activities. Um, and I think one of the things is that, as you said, I mean, Yuhua Kenyatta did have particularly deep pockets because of the money uh, of his family who kind of basically said, have as much as you want this time around when they haven't been so generous in previous elections. Um, but there was a lot of money on all sides. Um, and I think what was interesting is how, not, not just that Jubilee had more money, but how much more effective they were in that use of money. Um, they just ran a much tighter, more organized, slick campaign. They had clearer narratives, they had clearer messages. Um, and they didn't suffer from the same kind of internal divisions and corruption as Cord. Uh, Cord was very d badly damaged by some of the problems that went on during the party primaries. Uh, and there were also rumors, for example, that some members of the Cord team stole the money that was meant to pay the party agents, which meant you didn't have very loyal party agents sitting through the very, very long uh, voting and tallying process, which may mean that Cord doesn't have all of the evidence that might be open to it if it had had a better party agent system. Um, so yeah, money, absolutely essential, um, but I think one of the interesting things is their different use of that money and how effectively it was used. Great, thank you. Thank you for restricting yourself. Hopefully we'll have time for people to talk informally afterwards. I am really gonna have to limit you to one comment, please. El Paso. <laughs> all right. So yeah, it's a very important question you raise about the, the fiscal space. Um, but it's, it's the logic of, of, of winning elections that drives all of that. You know, because resolving, rationalizing the, the you know the, the wage, uh, uh, the public wages was one of the things that governments over the years failed to do because it's just worried about how they were going to deal with that. But once a government decided to take that you know challenge the first thing they were thinking about is how we're going to please everybody um and you know high increases for the police and the military and and then it just opened up all kinds of demands from all kinds of public sector and just created this this space now we have a huge weight bill we can deal with and for me that is the it, it shows you that political parties are not disciplined and leaders are not going disciplined as long as they feel that they have to do anything to win elections you know, so our deficit, for instance, which was a, a target of 6.7 uh, in 2012, going to the elections, now after the elections, it's 12%. We've doubled that. You know, so for me, uh, that whole sense that we are going to be driven and structured by political competition is, is the worry for, 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 I think, Logana, but even Kenya, that the ho only thing you want to do is let me just hold on to power <coughs> When I get there, I will deal with the problems. But it doesn't, it doesn't get you to economic transformation. Great, thank you. And Dowdy, you're sitting in Nairobi. Uh, you're working very closely with different civil society groups. So I'm giving you the last word, your last reflection. Okay, maybe I can um, try and tackle the ethnic question. 
by repeating what I said before. What we saw at the ballot box was that voters, you know, voted for radical change on a local level um, against their ethnic lines, against the very strong ethnic candidates at, at the local level. But that didn't translate to the vote at the national level. So it's more than people simply voting for their tribe. They voted against their tribe at, at home in many instances. It's just that um, that was one of the key factors at the national level and something that needs to be investigated a little bit deeper. Great. Many thanks. Well, I think the bifurcation between sort of local election results and national pictures is a feature of all of our electoral <laughs> democracies. So I think that's one for further <laughs> investigation. I want to thank all of you, all of the speakers, uh, discussants very much for absolutely fantastic opening of what we hope is a series looking at different uh, electoral transitions around, around the world and trying to engage with uh, their role in, in bigger political and economic transformation processes. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, and thank you to Alina and her team for organising a really interesting debate. Thank you. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you.